Hello and welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jay and this is a web of classic tales. If you're enjoying the videos, please like, subscribe, and share. If you want notifications every single time a new video is uploaded, please click on the little bell icon. Today we will continue reading H.G. Wells, The War of the Worlds. I spent that night in the inn that stands at the top of Putney Hill, sleeping in a made bed for the first time since my flight to Leatherhead. I will not tell you the needless trouble I had breaking into that house. Afterwards, I found the front door was on the latch. Nor how I ransacked every room for food, until, just on the verge of despair, in what seemed to me to be a servant's bedroom, I found a rat gnawed crust and two tins of pineapple. The place had been already searched and emptied. In the bar, I afterwards found some biscuits and sandwiches that had been overlooked. The latter I could not eat, they were too rotten, but the former not only stayed my hunger, but filled my pockets. I lit no lamps, fearing some Martian might come beating that part of London for food in the night. Before I went to bed, I had an interval of restlessness, and prowled from window to window, peering out for signs of these monsters. I slept little. As I lay in bed, I found myself thinking consecutively, a thing I do not remember to have done since my last argument with the curate. During all the intervening time, my mental condition had been a hurrying succession of vague emotional states, or a sort of stupid receptivity. But in the night, my brain, reinforced, I suppose, by the food I had eaten, grew clear again, and I thought. Three things struggled for possession of my mind. The killing of the curate, the whereabouts of the Martians, and the possible fate of my wife. The former gave me no sensation of horror or remorse to recall. I saw it simply as a thing done, a memory infinitely disagreeable, but quite without the quality of remorse. I saw myself then as I see myself now, driven step by step towards the hasty blow, the creature of a sequence of accidents leading inevitably to that. I felt no condemnation, yet the memory, static, unprogressive, haunted me. In the silence of the night, with that sense of the nearness of God that sometimes comes into the stillness of the darkness, I stood my trial, my only trial, for that moment of wrath and fear. I retraced every step of our conversation from the moment when I had found him crouching beside me, heedless of my thirst, and pointing to the fire and smoke that streamed up from the ruins of Weybridge. We had been incapable of cooperation. Grim chance had taken no heed of that. Had I foreseen, I should have left him at Halliford, but I did not foresee and crime is to foresee and do, and I set this down as I have set all this story down, as it was. There were no witnesses, all these things I might have concealed, but I set it down, and the reader must form his judgment as he will. And when, by an effort, I had set aside that picture of a prostrate body, I faced the problem of the Martians and the fate of my wife. For the former, I had no data. I could imagine a hundred things, and so, unhappily, I could for the latter, and suddenly that night became terrible. I found myself sitting up in bed, staring at the dark. I found myself praying that the heat ray might have suddenly and painlessly struck her out of being. Since the night of my return from Leatherhead, I had not prayed. I had uttered prayers, fetish prayers, had prayed as heathens mutter charms when I was in extremity. But now I prayed indeed, pleading steadfastly and sanely, face to face with the darkness of God strange night. Strangest in this, that so soon as dawn had come, I, who had talked with God, crept out of the house like a rat leaving its hiding place, a creature scarcely larger, an inferior animal, a thing that for any passing whim of our masters might be hunted and killed. Perhaps they also prayed confidently to God. Surely, if we have learned nothing else, this war has taught us pity. Pity for those witless souls that suffer our dominion. The morning was bright and fine, and the eastern sky glowed pink, and was fetid with little golden clouds. In the road that runs from the top of Putney Hill to Wimbledon was a number of poor vestiges of the panic torrent that must have poured Londonward on the Sunday night after the fighting began. There was a little two-wheeled cart inscribed with the name of Thomas Lobb, Green Grocer, New Malden, with a smashed wheel and an abandoned tin trunk. There was a straw hat trampled into the now hardened mud, and at the top of West Hill, a lot of blood-stained glass about the overturned water trough. My movements were languid, my plans of the vaguest. I had an idea of going to Leatherhead, though I knew that there I had the poorest chance of finding my wife. Certainly, unless death had overtaken them suddenly, my cousins and she would have fled thence, but it seemed to me I might find or learn whither the Surrey people had fled. I knew I wanted to find my wife, that my heart ached for her in the world of men, but I had no clear idea how the finding might be done. I was so sharply aware now of my intense loneliness. From the corner I went, under cover of a thicket of trees and bushes, to the edge of Wimbledon Common, stretching wide and far. 
The dark expanse was lit in patches by yellow gorse and broom. There was no red weed to be seen, and as I prowled, hesitating, on the verge of the open, the sun rose, flooding it all with light and vitality. I came upon a busy swarm of little frogs in a swampy place among the trees. I stopped to look at them, drawing a lesson from their stout resolve to live, and presently, turning suddenly, with an odd feeling of being watched, I beheld something crouching amid a clump of bushes. I stood regarding this. I made a step towards it, and it rose up and became a man armed with a cutlass. I approached him slowly. He stood silent and motionless regarding me. As I drew nearer, I perceived he was dressed in clothes as dusty and filthy as my own. He looked, indeed, as though he had been dragged through a culvert. Nearer, I distinguished the green slime of ditches mixing with the pale drab of dried clay and shiny, coaly patches. His black hair fell over his eyes, and his face was dark and dirty and sunken, so that at first I did not recognize him. There was a red cut across the lower part of his face. Stop, he cried, when I was within ten yards of him, and I stopped. His voice was hoarse. Where do you come from? he said. I thought, surveying him. I come from Mort Lake, I said. I was buried near the pit the Martians made about their cylinder. I have worked my way out and escaped. There is no food about there, he said. This is my country. All this hill down to the river, and back to Clapham, and up to the edge of the common. There is only food for me. Which way are you going? I answered slowly. I don't know, I said. I have been buried in the ruins of a house thirteen or fourteen days. I don't know what has happened. He looked at me doubtfully, then started, and looked with a changed expression. I have no wish to stop about here, said I. I think I shall go to Leatherhead, for my wife was there. He shot out a pointing finger. It is you, said he, the man from Woking. And you weren't killed at Weybridge? I recognized him at the same moment. You are the artilleryman who came into my garden. Good luck, he said. We are lucky ones. Fancy you. He put out a hand and I took it. I crawled up a drain, he said, but they didn't kill everyone. And after they went away, I got off towards Walton across the fields. But it's not 16 days altogether, and your hair is grey. He looked over his shoulder suddenly. Only a rook, he said. One gets to know that birds have shadows these days. This is a bit open. Let us crawl under those bushes and talk. Have you seen any Martians? I said, since I crawled out. They've gone away across London, he said. I guess they've got a bigger camp there. Of a night all over there, Hampstead Way, the sky is alive with their lights. It's like a great city, and in the clear you can just see them moving. By daylight you can't. But nearer, I haven't seen them. He counted his fingers. Five days. Then I saw a couple across Hammersmith Way carrying something big. And the night before last, he stopped and spoke impressively. It was just a matter of lights, but it was something up in the air. I believe they've built a flying machine. And are learning to fly. I stopped on hands and knees, for we had come to the bushes. Fly? Yes, he said. Fly. I went on into a little bower and sat down. It is all over with humanity, I said. If they can do that, they will simply go round the world, he nodded. They will, but it will relieve things over here a bit. And besides, he looked at me, aren't you satisfied it is up with humanity? I am. We're down. We're beat, I stared. Strange as it may seem, I had not arrived at this fact, a fact perfectly obvious so soon as he spoke. I had still held a vague hope. Rather, I had kept a lifelong habit of mind. He repeated his words. We're beat. They carried absolute conviction. It's all over, he said. They've lost one. Just one. And they've made their footing good and crippled the greatest power in the world. They've walked over us. The death of that one at Weybridge was an accident. And these are only pioneers. They kept on coming. These green stars. I've seen none these five or six days, but I've no doubt they're falling somewhere every night. Nothing's to be done. We're under. We're beat. I made him no answer. I sat staring before me, trying in vain to devise some countervailing thought. This isn't a war, said the artilleryman. And it never was a war, any more than there's war between man and ants. Suddenly, I recalled the night in the observatory. After the tenth shot, they fired no more, at least until the first cylinder came. How do you know? said the artilleryman. I explained. He thought, something wrong with the gun, he said. But what if there is? They'll get it right again. And even if there's a delay, how can it alter the end? It's just men and ants. There's the ants builds their cities, live their lives, have wars, revolutions, until the men want them out of the way, and then they go out of the way. That's what we are now, just ants only. Yes, I said. We're eatable ants. We sat looking at each other. And what will they do with us? I said. That's what I've been thinking. After Weybridge, I went south, thinking. I saw what was up. Most of the people were hard at it squealing and exciting themselves. But I'm not so fond of squealing. I've been in sight of death once or twice. 
I'm not an ornamental soldier, and at the best and worst, death. It's just death. And it's the man that keeps on thinking comes through. I saw everyone trekking away south. Says I, food won't last this way, and I turned right back. I went for the Martians like a sparrow goes for man. All round, he waved a hand to the horizon. They're starving in heaps, bolting, treading on each other. He saw my face and halted awkwardly. No doubt lots who had money have gone away to France, he said. He seemed to hesitate whether to apologize, met my eyes, and went on. There's food all about here, can things and shops, wines, spirits, mineral waters, and the water mains and drains are empty. Well, I was telling you what I was thinking. Here's intelligent things, I said, and it seems they want us for food. First they'll smash us up. Ships, machines, guns, cities, all the order and organization. All that will go. If we were the size of ants, we might pull through. But we're not. It's all too bulky to stop. That's the first certainty. Eh? I assented. It is. I thought it out. Very well, then. Next, at present, we are caught as we are wanted. A Martian has only to go a few miles to get a crowd on the run. And I saw one, one day, out by Wandsworth, picking houses to pieces and rooting among the wreckage. But they won't keep on doing that. So soon as they've settled all our guns and ships, and smashed all our railways, and done all the things they are doing over there, they'll begin catching us systematic, picking the best and storing us in cages and things. That's what they will start doing in a bit. Gracious, they haven't begun on us yet. Don't you see that? Not begun, I exclaimed. Not begun. All that's happened so far is through our not having the sense to keep quiet, worrying them with guns and such foolery, and losing our heads, and rushing off in crowds to where there wasn't any more safety than where we were. They don't want to bother us yet. They're making their things, making all the things they couldn't bring with them, getting things ready for the rest of their people. Very likely that's why the cylinders have stopped for a bit, for fear of hitting those who are here. And instead of our rushing about blind on the howl, or getting dynamite on the chance of busting them up, we've got to fix ourselves up according to the new state of affairs. That's how I figure it out. It isn't quite according to what a man wants for a species, but it's about what the facts point to. And that's the principle I acted upon. Cities, nations, civilizations, progress. It's all over. The game's up. We're beat. But if that is so, what is there to live for? The artilleryman looked at me for a moment. There won't be any more blessed concerts for a million years or so. There won't be any Royal Academy of Arts. And no nice little feeds at restaurants. If it's amusement you're after, I reckon the game is up. If you've got any drawing room manners, or a dislike to eating peas with a knife, or dropping H's, you'd better shuck them away. There ain't no further use. You mean... I mean that men like me are going on living, for the sake of the breed. I tell you, I'm grim set on living. And if I'm not mistaken, you'll show what insides you've got too before long. We aren't going to be exterminated, and I don't mean to be caught either, and tamed and fattened and bred like a thundering ox. Ugh. Fancy those brown creepers. You don't mean to say. I do. I'm going on under their feet. I've got it planned. I've thought it out. We men are beat. We don't know enough. We've got to learn before we've got a chance. And we've got to live and keep independent while we learn. See, that's what has to be done. I stared astonished and stirred profoundly by the man's resolution. Good gracious, cried I. But you are a man indeed. And suddenly I gripped his hand. Eh, he said, with his eyes shining. I've thought it out, eh? Go on, I said. Well, those who mean to escape their catching must get ready. I'm getting ready. Mind you, it isn't all of us that are made for wild beasts. And that's what it's got to be. That's why I watched you. I had my doubts. You're slender. I didn't know that it was you, you see. Or just how you'd been buried. All these. The sort of people that lived in these houses. And all those little clerks that used to live down the way. They'd be no good. They haven't any spirit in them. No proud dreams and no proud lusts. And a man that hasn't one or the other? Well, what is he but funk and precautions? They just used to skedaddle off to work. I've seen hundreds of them, bit of breakfast in hand, running wild and shiny to catch their little season ticket train, for fear they'd get dismissed if they didn't, working at businesses they were afraid to take the trouble to understand, skedaddling back for fear they wouldn't be in time for dinner, keeping indoors after dinner for fear of the back streets, and sleeping with the wives they married, not because they wanted them, but because they had a bit of money that would make for safety in their one little miserable skedaddle through the world. Lives insured and a bit invested for fear of accidents. And on Sundays, fear of the hereafter. As if hell was built for rabbits. Well, the Martians would just be a godsend to these. Nice roomy cages, fattening food, careful breeding, no worry. After a week or so chasing about the fields and lands on empty stomachs, they'll come and be caught cheerful. They'll be quite glad after a bit. They'll wonder what people did before there were Martians to take care of them. And the bar loafers, and mashers, and singers. I can imagine them. 
he said with a sort of somber gratification. There'll be any amount of sentiment and religion loose among them. These hundreds of things I saw with my eyes that I've only begun to see clearly these last few days. There's lots will take things as they are, fat and stupid, and lots will be worried by a sort of feeling that it's all wrong, and that they ought to be doing something. Now whenever things are so that a lot of people think they ought to be doing something, the weak, and those who go weak with a lot of complicated thinking, always make for a sort of do-nothing religion, very pious and superior, and submit to persecution and the will of the Lord, very likely you've seen the same thing. It's energy in a gale of funk, and turned clean inside out. These cages will be full of psalms and hymns and piety, and those of a less simple sort will work in a bit of, what is it, eroticism? He paused. Very likely these Martians will make pets of some of them, train them to do tricks. Who knows, get sentimental over the pet boy who grew up and had to be killed. And some, maybe, they will train to hunt us. No, I cried. That's impossible. No human being. What's the good of going on with such lies? Said the artilleryman. There's men who'd do it cheerfully. What nonsense to pretend there isn't? And I succumbed to his conviction. If they come after me, he said, if they come after me, and subsided into a grim meditation. I sat contemplating these things. I could find nothing to bring against this man's reasoning. In the days before the invasion, no one would have questioned my intellectual superiority to his. I, a professed and recognized writer on philosophical themes, and he, a common soldier, and yet he had already formulated a situation that I had scarcely realized. Thank you for listening. This has been H.G. Wells, The War of the Worlds, Book 2, Chapter 7, Part 1. I've been Jay. This has been a web of classic tales. Please like, subscribe, share, comment, click the bell icon for notifications. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Have a nice life, and I'll see you next time.